Scott Brehop. I'm an aquatic biologist too here at the aquarium, um, which means a lot of different things. Uh, basically animal care for a lot of the animals in the building, a lot of the exhibits. Uh, currently I have the large shark tank, which includes the four shark rays um, and some of the other uh, elasma franks and sharks in the building. When you look at their body, uh, the thing I love about aquatic animals is that the fin structure of the animal will kind of tell you what it does. Um, you're basically look at a stingray, it doesn't have any dorsal fins, it's got really large pectoral fins, that's more of a bottom dwelling animal. Um, you look at the shark rays, it's, they do have larger dorsal fins, but they're set further back on the body. So then you move over to like sand tigers, slower moving, kind of docile, just moving slow around the tank. Their fin structures are smaller, set further back. And then you go to like a black tip, which is a hunter, or a sandbar, which is a hunter. Big peck fins, big dorsal fins, so they can cut and move through the water. We think that they, they, they are going to be more, probably more diurnal, maybe night. Um, the eyes, we've had an ocular physician in, and the eye structure cones and rods bodes to them being able to see at, in dark situations or murky situations. Um, the probably diurnal feeders. From what we learned from the pups that we have had here is the coloring from when they are little, when they are pups, is brilliant black and white, stark black and white, and a lot of coloration. Not what you see on our adults right now. Um, that fades out to different variations. Um, as a pup, that is mainly their sole way of not being eaten is really the only way that we see that they survive being a pup into adulthood. Um, now I can tell all four of them apart because they all then fade out to different sets of patterns. Um, later years now it's actually getting a little bit difficult to tell some of them apart because their patterns are starting to look a lot alike. Um, but all of them have their own set of markings, just like a human, different characteristics on them. The from the dorsally, the, spotting, the spotted pattern is how we can tell them apart. Um, from there it's male, female, claspers, no claspers. Um, and from what I've learned from them, you can tell behavior too when you watch them long enough. We see the horn structure across the head, across the eyes, and um, that dorsal ridge, kind of called the mohawk sometimes. Um, that is, we actually found out with Sweet Pea about a year after we had her, we started seeing one of them, a couple of those um, horns turn white and start peeling away, and we were actually kind of worried about it, but then we noticed that it came off and more went into place. So that horn structure actually replaces just like a teeth. Um, and is a super thick cartilage. That whole horn is cartilage um, down into the body. Um, on the shark ray, first, and since I have it right here, is the jaw structure. Um, another name for shark ray is bow mouth guitar fish. So you see the mouth structure. And this, if you look closely at the bigger ones, you'll see this is a small one. So the structure hasn't completely set up, but it has these knuckle platings in here that fit into each other for that crushing power, mainly lobster or shellfish, um, plus the diamond-shaped teeth. Um, they're not sharp teeth, they're crushing teeth. Uh, they do replace them exactly like big sharks, where one pushes out when they need to replace a broken or an injured one, it comes out too. Um, we find them all the time in the tank. You can imagine them, the spiny lobster shell is uh, very strong. Take a hammer to crush it. These guys crush it with no problem. Um, the jaw structure is made to do that. That interwoven knuckle design is made to crush the lobster, crush it up, get the meat out of it. Um, they do swallow everything. Uh, occasionally they'll spit out shell, but most of it all goes down, goes into the stomach, and gets digested, used, or passed on through. Um, feeding from not just the jaw structure is that, that enormous flat head that they have where they can almost pin the prey to the bottom and manipulate it so they can get it into the mouth and catch it and bite down on it. In the wild, normal diet would be, let's say just about anything they could catch. Easiest thing for these animals to catch is not fish. It is a crustacean, a lobster, a crab, shrimp, um, mollusks, anything that's sitting on the bottom, that's definitely bottom feeding. When you look at the morphology of the body, that big bowed head, it is something that they're going to be 
able to pounce on and push to the bottom and eat like that. Um, here, we have found out that lobster is a, we feed them Florida spiny lobster or Maine lobster whenever we have it, and we believe that is a um, bonus to how well we have done with our animals here. Um, they do get fish in their diet, they do get squid in their diet. Um, now with the different versions of the feeds, when we were feeding underwater, it was all lobster. And then whatever they would gather off of broadcast feeds in the tank. Now it's a mix of lobster and fish because we have the ability to mix that up. We don't have to be in the water with a fish, which is not a good idea in this tank. In the beginning, it was a handheld target that we would dive. Uh, two divers, a four divers, a safety diver, and a feeder diver. Um, it's basically a flat target with a plunger. The lobster would be loaded in. We present the target to the animal that you wanted. They come up, basically lay on the target, and we would plunge the food into their mouth. Um, we still use that target for training sessions in our acclimation pool. Um, bring them in, get blood draws on them and such. Now that we have four very large animals, going in with a lobster in the tank would be fairly dangerous. Um, they are, sweet peas, about 260 pounds. When she would hit, when you were doing underwater feeders, it was like getting hit by a large linebacker. Um, so now we've moved to surface feedings. A um, couple of different versions. Uh, pole targets where they would ride up the pole and we could hand feed them or tong feed them. Um, now we've transitioned to a target on the end of a pole or a pole as a target that we can bring each one up to the surface and then tong feed them the food that they want so we know each one is getting uh, their allotted lobster or fish. Surface feeding has its own hurdles. These animals are made to eat off the bottom. That's what they do. It takes a little finagling by us, a little finesse, <laughs> to get them the food in the right way and teach them that when they come up, this is what they need to do at the surface to feed. Shark rays are from Indonesian waters all the way over to Australia is where they're found, um, Indo-Pacific waters. Uh, to start with the differences between the aquarium and the natural habitat is we, we try to keep it as close in proximity um, as far as water chemistry, temperature, um, light cycle a little bit. When you get into a public aquariums, you have a lot of stuff going on that has to change that. We try to, cl as closely with all the animals here, resemble their natural habitat because that is going to provide the healthiest specimen, the healthiest animal that we can take care of here. Sweet pea we know was caught in a fisherman's net um, in Indonesian waters and got to the collector, the, the resourcer for us and then got to us. Um, Spike came from our sister aquarium in Adventure, um, Camden, New Jersey, and I believe he was also collected by the same person. My educated guess is that they would be solitary animals most of their lives. Um, as pups, they might live in a congregation, but with the size and what we've seen out of the behavior of ours, they would probably separate, go their separate ways. Again, educated guess, there might be a point in time, a um, environmental or a seasonal event that brings them together to mate or to con congregate in one area and then probably go off. Um, I can't say that our four live fairly well together in this closed, tighter system. Um, 
which bodes well to think that there is possibly congregations of them that could live together also. As pups, yes, they'd be prey to anything. They come out about 70 to 80 centimeters, so they're small little pups. Um, equipped, they come out exactly like the adults, uh, ridge of horns. Um, when they first come out, it's covered in a mucous membrane so that it doesn't hurt the mom when she has the pups. Um, but they, that is their only protection other than their camouflage pattern. Um, which is what makes them survive. So as pups, they'd be prey. At this size, um, highly doubt they'd be prey for any animal. From there, it's all human interaction, um, catching them for fins, uh, catching them for meat, whatever they would be. We have, through working with these guys, we have learned a lot through any interaction in the wild that they've had. Um, we have, they are among the other guitar fish in the guitar fish family. Um, and the morphology of the body, you see that. It, it is half shark, half ray. And you can see as evolution changes, they become ray or they become shark. Our best guess on gestation is eight to 12 months. Um, if Sweet Pea has another clutch of pups, we might know that better if we can acknowledge it. And now that we have seen the progression of her specifically, um, we might be able to come up with a better timeline. Um, best we can do is related to their closest relative, which is guitar fish. Uh, sawfish is probably the closest that we can think of to them, which is sawfish are more documented than shark ray. So eight to 12 months is our guess. Um, and like I said, if we get other clutches out of Sweet Pea, um, we might be able to track it, watch it more, watch development in her, um, since we can do so much hands-on stuff with her. With a, a clutch of eight to 10 or eight to 12, uh, it's all about those animals camouflage and being able to survive after they are born. Um, basically hiding, hiding until they can get food, hiding until they can get big enough. Um, and there, a lot of sharks is mass numbers or larger pups to be able to handle being predated on. We believe this species is very threatened. Now, there is not a lot known about them in the wild, um, not a whole lot known about them in captivity from other than from what we've done and what other aquariums have done with them. Um, threatened is most likely where they're at um, solely because they are so rare to be seen in the wild, so rare to come across them in the wild. Um, a lot of wild caught specimens are in um, fishermen's nets, long lines, stuff like that, that they are basically bycatch for what they're looking for. Um, and that's what is mainly known about them is from that and from what we do here.